So this is our prayer for Israel, for um, Shmuel and Mikkel as they're having a holiday, and for Sondra and the Volunteer and Solidarity Mission. They're there starting today, and their first journey is to go down to the Gaza envelope. So we're praying this prayer over all of Israel and over our um, beloved friends uh, in Samaria and Judea. It's the song of ascent, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. We praise you, Lord for your beloved Israel. Amen. Maya, we'd Amen. like to welcome you and um, everybody, welcome aboard. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me join you. Um, my name is Maya Beretta. I have been with uh, CFOIC for over three years. For uh, about two, two and a half years, I was uh, the, uh, the content writer, manager, and um, our project manager. So uh, all information that you've received about the projects was written by me. Um, and uh, and recently, uh, as Shmuel moved over to become our, our director, I have moved in, uh, more into a role of uh, outreach. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, and uh, I live also, I live in Carnation Road. So just a, a seven minute walk from our office, so that's mighty convenient. And uh, I have uh, five children. Um, two of them are adults, so I have a 23-year-old, a 19-year-old, 17-year-old, uh, three girls, and then I have boys who are 14 and 10. So uh, for the most part, I have two kids at home right now. But um, um, I, you know, I'm joining you today first of all because. Uh, as Pam said, Shmuel, uh, she worked him to the bone. She put so many meetings in front of him, and he was thrilled. Really, really. Uh, and, and I don't. I'm sorry. My geography of, of Australia is really terrible, so excuse me. But I know that he had to sometimes even fly midday and have meetings in one place and meeting in another. Uh, he was thrilled. He was thrilled at what Pam was doing to expand um, our reach to to Christians who love Israel and want to hear about the biblical heartland. Um, and uh, and as Pam said, also Sandra is here with our group today. Uh, a group started a group of a mission of volunteer and solidarity with Israel. Um, it is it is beyond comprehension for Israelis and um, that the Christians are coming to Israel during wartime to stand with us. As you know, um, the agricultural uh, sector in Israel has been hit tremendously hard. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of vegetables, 75% of, of vegetables is, uh, was, is grown in the communities that are the parameter of Gaza, so the southern communities. And, um, and so those were hit initially by October 7th, then the military not letting people in, uh, obviously, because of what happened. The agriculture uh, has been hit tremendously. Um, um, obviously, not knowing who to trust in. Oh, the the, the Arabs. Um, there were tens of thousands of, of Arabs from Gaza that came regularly to work in the southern communities. Um, and what was discovered later by intelligence is that they were all collecting intelligence. In fact, they have they had names of homes and who lived there and where to go. They had direct intelligence from those. So, so clearly Israel cannot let um, those individuals come and help us. Uh, then they were, we had a lot of, we have thousands of, of uh, employees from Thailand who came. Some of them were uh, 
murdered on October 7th. Some of them were um, kidnapped. And so the remaining, I think over 6,000 left the beginning of the war. So uh, the fact that we have a, a group of Christians who are coming to help and we have great schedule uh, set up for them, they're going to go to the Jordan Valley, they're going to help there, they're going to help in a bakery here in um, um, in Carnation Rhone, they are going to visit injured soldiers. It, it's um, it's incredible. And we, we are, we're proud to have you as friends. Um, so, uh, let me see what is happening right now for us is, is a life that's upside down. Yes. I go to work every day. My kids go now go to school. At the beginning of the war, there was no school. There were less teachers, uh, available because there were many teachers who were called up for reserve duty, or if they were male, if they were female, if they had younger children at home, then they were not able to uh, leave them. I'm not sure exactly what the, some of the schools were closed. So, um, so now, so there's been school, it's been consistent. The kids have a routine, which is important. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're always holding our breaths. We're always in a position of what's going to happen next. You know, it's the U.S. putting pressure on Israel. Is Israel really going to go into Rafah and finish this? Um, and then, of course, there's the North, and the North is um, is scary. It's it's scary. I mean, there are uh, also a lot of agriculture over there. And uh, just last week, there was an anti missile, uh, anti tank missile that hit. Uh, in the middle of a field and uh, killed one and injured, I think seven. They were all actually from Thailand. Uh, and, and so now they also don't wanna work, understandably so. Um, and in the meantime, there is a lot of talk of what is life going to be when, it's not even if, when Israel enters into a full war uh, with Hezbollah in the North. And um, and the the big thing to prepare for is um, there's, it's, I don't even think that it, it really is an if they, they are, there are 150,000 guided missiles, uh, that Hezbollah has in its possession that are aiming towards Israel. And Israel is confident that they're going to try and hit major infrastructure. So what is, what Israel is preparing for is really no water, no electricity, um, no communications. We don't really know what to expect. It's like, it's, it's, we're expecting, you know, I would say war like it were many years ago. Cause right now we're not really feeling it, especially in Judea and Samaria. We're not feeling the direct, um, we don't, we're not hearing the, the missiles that a lot of the missiles are not, not even coming in our direction. They're coming more in the North. They're coming in the South, but not, um, towards Samaria in particular in the center. Um, but but we're, it's, you know, I don't want to use a, a biblical word of Armageddon, but like we're, we're expecting really a, uh, an upside down um, reality w without technology, without water and without power. So uh, specifically for, for CFO, I see we're starting to, to receive some projects from, for example, um, some communities are saying we need to, to stock our bomb shelters. We're expecting our residents to be in bomb shelters for we don't know for what extent of time. And so we need to provide beds and cots and, and water and, and communication devices and, and even some equipment to rescue uh, people from under uh, rubble that has been destroyed by missiles. That that's It doesn't even seem real that I'm saying this, but this is uh, what, what this one particular community is preparing for. Other communities are definitely, um, particularly the Samaria regional community, I've just spoken with them and they, they need you know, several for like three of their regions, they need generators on on trailers. They need water, big water um, tanks on trailers, lighting on trailers. They just uh, they're preparing also for for a completely disconnect from all infrastructure, and and it's scary. It's scary. When I look at my, you know, I, I feel very privileged. I you know I work in in Carnation Rhone, and I don't really leave very often because most of my life is here. I order groceries from a nearby town, Farsaba. And so then I'm, every time I, I, I do my, my grocery shopping, I think I should order like some like these big bulk 
you know, rice and, and all this stuff. And then I'm like, but when is it going to come? Because Israel initially was saying that it will happen in August or September. But now I think there was some ultimatum that uh, Bibi Netanyahu had given um, Nasrallah saying that it would be, you know, that he has one month. So until I believe the end of March to to move back to the, the line beyond um, which they were supposed to have stayed. So so there's a lot of uncertainty of what our lives are really going to be like uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, in the meantime, um, and in the meantime, there, there are a lot of rockets hitting the north. Just yesterday, as I was kind of looking to see what I can share with you guys, uh, I got a message from one of the news uh, sources that I have. It was 1030 in the morning, and it, and it said, since this morning... Uh, 80 missiles have come and hit up north from from Lebanon, and that's happening over and over. So it's it's a uh, it's stressful, and we're trying to go on with our lives uh, as much as we can because what's the point in sitting in a fetal position and waiting for the worst, right? But but at the other hand, it's also hard to prepare for something when it's it's so overwhelming and it's. And so unknown. Um, the good news, on the one hand, is that um, this past year, uh, since twenty, since the beginning of twenty twenty three, um, there's been a really a big victory to the Zionist uh, settlement movement in Judea and Samaria uh, of construction. So um, at the at the beginning of twenty twenty three. Smutrich, uh, Betzalel Smutrich, signed an agreement with the defense minister, Yoav um, Gallant, Gallant um, saying that, um, wait, let me back up. Up until February of, of a year ago, the military, the Israeli, the IDF had complete control over all areas of governance in Judea and Samaria. Um, even though we obviously we pay taxes, we get benefits from the government when we live here, uh, the, the ultimate control of, of running things was with the military, which also meant that uh, approval of construction was a very, very slow process. Now, I would say, uh, as an aside, that Israelis, as much as there was a lot of struggle and conflict before the before the war, as we all know, um, that a uh, lot of anti-religious people anti-government, uh, anti-judicial reform. Um, a lot of it has dissipated. Uh, the Jewish people have truly come together as we we can, and we know is the only way for us to really receive God's blessing and protection. And uh, uh, wait, I'm looking at my time. Oh, there's, okay, so Julie is here. <laughs> um, um we have come together. However, there are still some forces, and unfortunately, some of them are in high positions in the military that are very much against the uh, religious people. The, on the one hand, they really want all ultra-Orthodox Jews to join the military. On the other hand, they mock them and um, and want them to become secular. Um, so, so there was so the whole process of of uh, of getting. Uh, work uh, building permits was very very slow. So comes Smotrich last February, and he uh, he signs an agreement, and basically the management of the civil side of the the Jewish people who live there has moved over to Smotrich's control, which meant that uh, from uh, February twenty three until July of twenty three, there was uh, there were approved thirteen thousand uh, residential units, which is six times what it was in prior year. Uh, now it's a little deceiving because th this number also includes like preliminary permits versus, you know, actual permits. Um, but but the bottom line is that it's it's moving. And, uh, and lastly, it was last month, there was a big uh, terror attack in Maledumim, just outside of Jerusalem. And the, the Israeli immediate response was, we have, are approving 3,500 homes to be built in Malay Dumim, which is a, a very, very large uh, change for uh, the attitude of the Israeli government saying, we are no longer going to, I mean, I think we're not going to destroy your home, the home of a family of a terrorist. I think that, you know, 
there should be some consequences directly, but any terrorist that is even considering causing uh, pain or a terror attack to the Jewish people who are reclaiming the biblical heartland, guess what? Any attempt is going to cause an even greater entrenchment of the Jewish people in the biblical heartland. And uh, so it's just a direct relationship. And um, we are just really, we're not giving up. We're here to stay. We're here to stay in our land. Um, so, but the problem is, is that we also are not letting Arabs into our communities now, because as you know, our, our neighbors have always, we've always known, while the South has always lived under this uh, this illusion that they that the the Arabs in Gaza want peace and they want to live side by side to us. Uh, they brought them in. They brought them into their homes uh, and and also caused a lot of intelligence about who where they are um, to be brought down to Hamas. The uh, um, we've always known that they 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 want to kill us. Um, it's not it's not a surprise or a secret. So so although. There were, you know, background checks. We we had a lot of construction workers that uh, that came into Israel, um, into our communities in Judea and Samaria. I had a complete remodel of my home uh, four years ago, and uh, oh, the contractor was was Israeli, but many of his workers were uh, were Palestinian Arabs and wonderful people. Um, although I have to say, one of the things that happens. Um, is you also have to watch out for is is uh, some small terrorist attacks within your homes. For example, I had um, uh, a year and a half after they finished that my renovation, all of a sudden I start there's like a lot of water damage underneath one of our uh, air conditioning units. And as it turns out, one of the Arab workers has put in rocks and cement in the uh, the pipe that where the all the um, evaporated water comes out of. And so it was causing water damage. I have other friends who had uh, a house actually built. And within a few months, the entire uh, toilet has just, everything has just coming out because again, they put cement. And so there's like, even those that get background checks, uh, try and kind of stick it to us one way or another. But anyway, so to hamper down the the, the great news of, of all this construction is the fact that we're now in war and we're not, we're trusting our, our neighbors even less. And so there's a real crisis in construction. And in Israel already, housing is so expensive, there's a real crisis in finding affordable homes. And so uh, recently the Samaria uh, municipality signed an agreement with India to bring in a thousand um, foreign workers to do construction in Judea and Samaria. So, Hopefully, um, I don't know. I have I have a special uh, um, soft spot, I guess, for India because they were they uh, received their independence from the British around the same time as we did. Uh, in fact, I learned about them when I was in fifth grade when I, I grew up in Israel. Um, and so uh, they're you know they're going to come and, and help us and and uh, and join in our efforts to get more entrenched and and get stronger presence in our in our homeland. Um, so. I okay. I want to do just a, a really quick before I transition to Julie, and I don't see Julie. Wait, let me see. We just move. I can't. Oh, she'll well when she speaks. I'll uh, I'll introduce her. But this week is the beginning of the Jewish month of Adar, which is um, the the holiday. We have the holiday of Purim, and um, one thing that is different for us this year is that uh, well, a few things. Number one. Because the Jewish calendar follows both the lunar and uh, the sun, um, every four years, I believe, we have an extra month of Adar. So why this is special is because the month of Adar is known. We're supposed to increase in our joy. We're supposed to bring in joy. And and it is a Jewish um, belief that uh, happiness and joy is something we, we choose to do. Um, after all, the Bible in the Bible, we are commanded to be joyous. Um, we are commanded to serve God with joy. How can we command a, um, a feeling? We always think like, well, I, I can't control how I feel. And and the truth of it is, is that we we believe that the mind is higher than the heart, and we can um, we can tra uh, tra uh, not transfer redirect our attention to the good things and the positive things in order to bring to highlight the goodness, the light of God, the goodness in the world. So 
Uh, so on the one hand, it's very challenging for us to bring, obviously, it's, it's more challenging this year to bring joy because we are surrounded by so much tragedy and loss and, um, and uncertainty. On the other hand, um, we have two months of this. So we're supposed to, obviously, it's a gift. It's a special gift for us to, to really work hard and really bring in more joy into this world. Um, specifically, I'm sure you know, we read the scroll of Esther um, and, and Esther has done a, uh, you know, Esther made a choice also. Esther was, was an orphan. She, uh, her father, our sources tell us, uh, passed away while she was still in utero. Her mother passed away in birth. She was raised as an orphan. Her um, uncle then married her. And then she was basically forced um, to go to a the cruel king's um, and forced into being, to submitting to being um, his wife. Um, and, uh, and there's, there's a passage in there where she's going to, uh, she's going to speak to the king and, and she says, um, wait, I'm sorry, I wrote it down. She walks towards the court and she cries to God. She says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? And it's really, really easy for all of us in terms of when life throws us challenges and difficulties and, and tragedies to, 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 uh, to just help make it or allow it to push us down to, uh, to helplessness, to sadness, to anger. It takes work. It takes belief. It takes faith to know that God has a purpose, that I have a purpose and my purpose and all of your purpose is to bring light into this world. And, um, and so she gathered, she refocused, and she became the savior of not just herself, because clearly, I mean, she, I mean, she could have been saved possibly as a wife of the king, uh, despite the decree, but she saved her entire nation and, and that, and she represents the, the power of, of what we need to do in this world. And really specifically the power of, of Jewish women. Um, we, despite the difficulties and challenges, we we can't just sit down and in, in pity. We have to keep on going. We have a purpose. We have a mission. God put us here in this land, and therefore, I um, and, and that's and that's what we're doing every single day. Yeah, easy, hard. It's it's the job. So I want to introduce uh, my friend Julie Schwartz, who um, is an amazing woman, um, mother, wife. She's also the first lady of my synagogue. She's the wife of the president. <laughs> um, and um, I, will, I will ask her some questions because um, she said to me that she's, this is, this is beyond her comfort zone. So you guys are seeing a woman who is really putting herself out there uh, to share with you guys what we are going through. Hi, Julie. Wait, let me unmute. Oh, okay. You're unmuted. Right. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, uh, public speaking is not my forte, <laughs> so. Um, but it's nice to meet you all. Um, Julie, I'd love to I'd love to welcome you on behalf of us, and uh, we will love everything that you give to us. So please feel relaxed and and please feel our love towards you. Thank you so much. That's so nice. <laughs> So um, Julie, yeah. tell me, tell me a little bit about your family. Tell me a little bit about what has been going on for your family specifically since uh, October 7th. But first, where are you from and how many kids you have and, and stuff like okay. that? Okay. So um, I'm, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, in the middle of the United States. Um, when I was 15, my family moved to New York. I went to college in New York City and met my husband in college, we got married. Um, five years later, we made Aliyah, we moved to Israel. My husband had grown up in Israel and um, always it was just a question of uh, when he wanted to, he was coming back. Um, I had grown up in a traditional home um, that Israel was something that you um, supported, but not necessarily lived there. And, uh, but I was open to the idea. We came on Aliyah, we came to the, uh, the Shomron and um, we, we built our family here. 
Um, I, I'm a technical writer. My background is in engineering, but I sort of moved over to technical writing. I work for a high tech company. My husband works for high tech also, uh, over the internet. Um, he works from home. I primarily work from home. Um, we, uh, we have seven children. Thank God. Um, uh, my oldest is 29. Um, I have three girls, then a boy, then a girl, then a boy, then a girl. Um, and currently, uh, my, and my youngest is 10. Um, currently, I have two children uh, actively serving in the Army. Um, and I have one daughter who is married, who her, her husband was called up as well on October 7th. Um, and um, uh, my, my son, who is in the Army, he's an officer um, in one of the in infantry divisions called Givati. And my daughter is um, in a unit that does field intelligence. Um, they gather information. She She's in charge of a group of girls who flies drones in Gaza. Um, the drones are to surveil over the units that go and do whatever they need to do. And uh, um, she was actually uh, working in conjunction with my son's unit, but they never actually met up in Gaza. In fact, um, it was over five months before they saw one another uh, since the beginning of the war. This past weekend, they were both home. It happened to work out. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's just sort of, a few facts about me. Um, what, what, what can I share? What would, so what would me, you like just, to hear? So yeah. What is, so your son-in-law, so your daughter, Elisheva, your oldest has moved uh, to live with you before the war started because it worked for them in terms of, of her schooling. And she has a, a year and a, and a half year old baby. Um, what, uh, what about her husband? Where did he go? How long was he gone and how did it affect her? Right. Right. So my son-in-law, um, he served in the paratroopers unit and um, he had finished his army service. He was in reserve duty um, on October 7th. Um, nobody knew what was happening as it was happening real time. And um, my children had sort of scattered to go to friends. Uh, it was, it's a holiday. Um, and one by one, they came home, and which is highly unusual because, you know, um, as observant Jews, we don't drive on holidays. And here they showed up at home because they were contacted one way or another from the army and told that they needed to show up at at point A, B and C. So um, uh, my son went out, my daughter went out, and then my son-in-law went out. And um, um, so... Uh, yeah, my, my daughter and son-in-law and their baby, they're living in a unit in our home. Like we have like a basement unit. Um, they're, they're actually part of a building project um, in um, the Gush Etzion settlement block. Uh, it's, a, a, it's a little uh, settlement called Kfar El Dad. And um, they, um, so while they're, while their unit is under construction, they're living by us. That was sort of the arrangement uh, from before. And it, it was, it basically saved my daughter um, in terms of not having to, she has a lot of friends that had to move back home to be with their parents because it was very hard for them to manage on their own while their husbands were away out of the house being single parents. And, uh, um, but she had us here, uh, you know, we were, here to back her up. Uh, so, um, it, it, it was challenging. It's, it, everybody sort of, uh, does what they can pretty much, um, you know, uh, uh, to help out in whatever way, um, you see it on an individual level, family level, communal level, na national level. Um, everybody has been trying to do what they can to just help and to, you know, work together. Um, how, so. how has the war affected your, let's say, your daily routine? We spoke a little bit about this yesterday. Um, right. So, okay, my immediate daily routine, if you look at it on the surface, it, it pretty much has remained the same. I work primarily from home. Um, but emotionally, I think, is where the, the major impact is. Um, 
because um, as any normal parent is, you worry about your children. You want your children to be safe. You want them, you want only good for them. And, um, you know, uh, living in Israel, um, you know, you realize that your children are going to serve in the army and you hope and pray that their service is uneventful and goes smoothly and quickly. And then they move on to the next phase of their life. Um, it just happens to be that I have two children, um, plus a son-in-law who, um, were right at this point in their life that they, um, were called up to, to help out in the war effort. And, um, um, it is, uh, I, I, I pretty much feel like life now is different than it was before October 7th. Uh, it is just a different way of living. Um, we used to make plans. We used to think ahead of time, you know, uh, months ahead of time, what we, you know, what we would uh, be doing. And more or less now I live sort of day to day. Um, I don't think about the future. I don't plan things. I don't really go anywhere. I have no intention of traveling anywhere. I, I want to stay put. I don't want to be far from my children. Um, you know, we don't hear from them for days at a time. It could be even weeks at a time. And so I, the phone rings, I drop everything. Um, I, you know, just to hear how they're doing, um, cause, uh, they don't have reception so much in Gaza. Um, and to just, I, I don't really think too deeply about what it is they do because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that I wish they didn't have to do. Um, but they must do, and I am proud of them for doing it. Um, and I am grateful to them for doing it. Um, I, I believe that they are protecting not just the immediate vicinity, but they're protecting our entire country. They're protecting the world because they are at the forefront of this force of evil because there's, it's nothing less than evil and darkness that um, they have brought to the world. Um, and I feel like my children represent the force of light and good. And, um, you know, I wish I could do it for them, but I can't. And it's in their hands and they are so young to have this responsibility, but they have wholeheartedly taken it upon themselves. Um, they, they do it with absolute, you know, complete um, sincerity and, uh, you know, uh, I, it's hard for me to find the right words, but, you know, um, Julie, I, just, I wanted to also remind you, we were talking about like another way that your daily routine has changed and, and that is what you carry with you at all times. And same for me, by the way, but I just wanted Julie to, to share. Well, um, I think it, so. All right. So, um, a lot of the day I will more or less compartmentalize. I sort of, you know, put it in a little box and I, you know, I try to function and go about my day and get done what needs to get done. Um, um, I, you know, I have uh, children at home still, you know, so I got to, you know, take care of them and everything like that. But, um, and I try to maintain some form of routine of sorts. Um, that includes walking my dog in the morning and, you know, I'll be walking him and, um, you know, you just sort of, your mind, you know, sort of goes into contemplation mode, meditation, whatever it is. And, um, um, I find like I, I will resort to a, a, a few mantras in my heart, you know, like, um, which are basically prayers, you know, constant prayers for the safety of my children, for all of our soldiers, for our people, for the world. Um, and, um, I think, you know, just in, in all of this contemplation, you know, I, I, there's certain realizations that I've come to, um, which, you know, you sort of say it, but, and you think it, but you know, when you have to live it, it's different. And one of those realizations is that God is in charge. Um, God is in control. We are not. And, um, we're nothing. I'm nothing. I, I'll, I'll, I can only speak for myself, you know, how I feel. Um, and I pray all the time that 
God guide me, guide our people, guide our soldiers to um, do his will. Um, there is a process that has been put into place. Um, I don't understand it all. It's, it's big. It's too big for me to be able to understand. Um, but God is, I, I do know that God is in charge and he is running this process. And I just ask and pray all the time that God guide me and our people, our soldiers to do his will, to do the right thing. Um, I, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, to, to help us through this process, it is not an easy process. Um, and, uh, um, it just protect us, protect our soldiers constantly, constantly in my thoughts. So, um, is that was that what you were referring to? <laughs> you know what? That that's also what we discussed. But the other thing I was actually specifically saying is that, um, you know, not like gun licenses in Israel are not uh, common. They have increased since and, and with the recent government. But really, only people living in dangerous areas are allowed to to carry guns. So first of all, lots of people have started carrying guns. But Julie specifically told me that her gun right. was always in the safe. Right. Uh, yes. But since I, the I, war. Yeah. Yeah, so I I had gotten I had actually gotten a gun license many many years ago um, because where we live um, the uh, residents were eligible. Um, it's a, a slightly easier process to be to get a license, so we took advantage of that and I got a gun. I kept it in the safe for many many years because I didn't feel comfortable with it. Um, I didn't I didn't feel like. Um, it was something that I could use responsibly, you know, if I had to, um, even though I would maintain the license and go for target practice and all the requisite, you know, things to maintain the license. Um, but after October 7th, I made the conscious decision that I must um, do the responsible thing. Um, the responsible thing is to carry the gun on me when I am out and about, when I'm walking the dog on the security road, when I, um, sometimes go into the city. Um, I also carry pepper spray, um, just because, you know, if I have to, I, I will protect my family. You know, I, I, you know, there's take the motions out, you know, um, I, I just will do what I need to do. Um, because we are under threat right now. Um, you know, right now Ramadan has started and there have been warnings that have gone out um, just to be vigilant and on alert because it's hard to know how certain sectors of the Arab population are going to behave, unfortunately. So that's right. I, I mean, personally, I, I want to share that, like, um, like I said, I, I don't really like Julie, I, I stay home. I stay in, in our community most of the time. But for sure, I always have uh, a weapon, which I only obtained since the war started. I felt like you know what, if, if anything happens like October 7th, again, which our neighbors, 85% of them in surveys conducted by, uh, by Palestinian authorities supported uh, Hamas in the events that happened on October 7th. Um, we have an Arab, many Arab villages around us. The closest one is 200 meters away from where we live. Um, I mean, they can walk here very, very easily. Um, I don't know that somebody's going to be here to protect my family. And so um, many, many people have, you know, and, and Julie is so sweet and soft spoken and, and, um, and, she, you know, it's, it's almost like antithesis to, to you know, like the, the, the personality. Um, and it, it makes no difference who you are and, and how comfortable you felt with it beforehand. Now it's life or death. Um, so there's really, it seems like there's no choice. We yeah. must defend ourselves. Um, the last question I wanted to ask you is, is how are you and maybe some of your neighbors are um, are viewing the uh, the looming uh, conflict with Hezbollah in Lebanon? And, and what, if anything, are you doing to prepare for that? Right. So um, it's again, it's part of this, um, you know, who knows what tomorrow will bring? Um, nobody knows. Uh, so um you, you sort of feel like uh, it's important to try to be somewhat responsible to, to plan a little bit. So, um, so we have actually purchased a generator. Um, I don't know how to use it, but we have it. 
Um, hopefully YouTube will help us uh, if in the case of need. I, I, I sort of hope we don't have to use it. Um, and also I started stocking up on uh, non-perishable food. Um, I happened to mention to Maya that my kids already dug into it though. I'm going to have to restock yeah. again. Um, but uh, um, that's, that's just what it is. Um, no, nobody. Uh, thank you guys for these kind messages. Oh my goodness. Um, I, you know, nobody wants to uh, be in this situation that we're in. Um, but this is what the reality is. And um, we're going to do whatever we can to try to make it through. And again, constantly with prayer in our heart to do what the right thing to do what God wants us to do and um, to, to do good, you know, also on a personal level, you know, I try, I'm trying to be a better person, you know, cause that's what I can do. You know, I can't, I can't go fight for my children. So what, what I can do is to try to be a better person. So, uh, you know, whatever that entails, you know, so Thank you so much, Julie. I think we have a little bit of time, Pam, right, for our questions. We do. Um, <coughs> Julie, I, I would like to say you've just rem reminded me I was in Jerusalem on October 7, and about October 9 or 10, we went up to the first station to do a bit of shopping to get water and things. And the lady at the checkout randomly said to me that she's not afraid of the war, she's not afraid of COVID, she just wants to be a better person. So wow. that, that's the heart of Israel. It's so deep. Do you want to honour God and, and honour life and people? Right. Thank you, for the tremendous uh, uh, a speech that you've given to us tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, thank and you. So nice. You guys are so nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love Israel and we love the people of the land. We just love you, all of us here. We thank you. Here. Thank you. And I do believe that love will prevail. Good will prevail. Light will prevail. You know, it has to because that is God. Yes, yes, yes. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Can you please keep them succinct so we can get through a few? But if you have a question for either of these beautiful ladies, Mark, you're kicking off. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much for sharing with us tonight. Um, my question relates to... <clears throat> Uh, your perception of the feeling of the Israeli people at this present point in time, do they want the, I'm talking generally here, do they want the war to be prosecuted, Israel to go into Rafah? Are they more concerned about the release of the hostages? How do you see the public opinion in Israel? We're getting very conflicting reports in the mainstream media about this. Um, I think I can I can answer that, that... Um that I believe, and Julie, you know, I'll give you a chance to, to respond also. Um, the, the two are one and the same. The majority, uh, especially the United States, is, is starting to separate uh, Netanyahu from the Jewish, from the Israeli people. He's, Bibi Netanyahu is standing for what most Israelis want. What we want is to go into Rafah because that is where Hamas is. That is the last stronghold of Hamas, and that is where our refugees are. Um, we are absolutely all. I mean, there is a one of the one survey that I that you know one of the news groups that I'm in, <clears throat> and it's uh, it had a quick survey of so what do you think? You know, should we go into Rafah? Uh, yes, no, or I don't know. And 92 percent of, of Israelis said they, we should go into Rafah. We absolutely must. It is the it is. Our end goal is to uh, disarm Hamas, take away their capabilities, and get our refugees. And that's that's the last stronghold. So so to go there is to really just not complete our mission. Does that answer your question, Mark? 
Yes, yes, thanks very much. Okay, Julie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, the only thing I would add is um, that um, my my son has told us, um, you know, from within Gaza, um, they don't really have their cell phones, the soldiers there. Um, they are sort of uh, disconnected from all of the noise, the background noise that goes on in the media. And they are totally focused on what they need to do and totally unified. And um, and it's good. It's a good thing because, um, you know, um, the, the listening to the news can confuse and um, dishearten. And, um, you know, uh, I think that the reality there is, you know, that they are they are what doing what they need to do. And I think that the vast majority of the country supports that. And, um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, I can only talk for myself specifically for a fact, you know, we want everybody to stay unified and focused and just do what needs to be done because this evil has to be destroyed. Thank you. Um, does anybody have a question for the ladies? Mm, usually we're overrun by questions. I, I just want to, I, I want to say, I want to go a little bit, um, just uh, some things that have happened really in the last 24 hours. Um, and that is the, uh, as, as you know, President Biden, the U.S. president is, is putting in a lot of pressure to, uh, um, to make Israel not go into Rafa. Uh, also putting a lot of pressure uh, into restructuring the Palestinian Authority in, in his efforts to, to have the Palestinian Authority take control of Gaza after the war. So a few uh, disturbing things that are happening. Number one is that the Palestinian Authority government basically resigned about a week ago. Uh, they resigned in an effort to Number one, appease the U.S. and try and find more uh, a less corrupt or somebody they'll be um, that the the Palestinians in uh, Judea and Samaria will support because they the most of them I think eighty something percent of them are um, I'm not sure if it's like even ninety but like in the high eighties do not support President Abbas uh, they do not they they believe that uh, government is extremely corrupt um, that is. The whole idea is is troubling for several reasons. One of them is is that uh, Hamas is now has put as one of the the people that they want released. If if there were ever another hostage release, they want to release uh, a person by the name of Marwan Barghouti, who's been in prison. Uh, he I think he got four consecutive life uh, sentences. He was involved very much involved in the first intifada. Um, second Intifada, he was actually a big um, rival of Yasser Arafat and has, it ex he's extremely popular. He's part of the Fatah movement, which is the, the Palestinian Authority, but uh, but he's very much opposed to them and he's very much opposed to Israel. But because he is willing to, because he is could be a unifying character that um, then that he's kind of being put as, as a possibility. Now, Hamas obviously is not uh, is 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 not a friend so much of uh, of uh, the Palestinian Authority. But one of the ideas is is that uh, if Hamas obtains his release, that he will be indebted to them, and therefore uh, Hamas will have its foot uh, more strongly in Judea and Samaria. Um, they have a lot of support here. A lot, they're very very much supported. The other thing that's happening is is, is that uh, the Palestinians are basically in, in Judea and Samaria are kind of doing a survey among all the terrorist groups, saying, you know, how can we resolve this? How can we bring in a government? And leaders of both Fatah and um, and Hamas are going to Russia, I believe, this week or next week, in order to discuss, discuss how to move forward with this new government. So, not to say that. You know, Hamas versus Fatah is is really any difference because um, the Palestinian Authority, as we know, supports terrorism, continues to support terrorism. Um, 
says one thing in English to the world uh, about, you know, wanting peace and, and, and to its people saying, we are absolutely going to destroy um, and take over the entire land. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's, you know, there's this, uh, this constant like looming um, power struggle that, that is, is, is more, you know, I don't know if more extreme, but, but um definitely, you know, puts more fear in what's going to happen with our neighbors that are surrounding us. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to uh, mention is something that happened just yesterday. Uh, as I mentioned previously, that, that in, in Israel, like, and Julie said, that there's a lot of unity. And even those who were very much anti-settlement movement and anti-religious um, are, are trying to embrace their Jewish brothers and sisters However, there is this extreme secular element, and unfortunately, in the um, in high positions in the military. So yesterday, there was um, uh, apparently there was a an orphanage in Gaza, and it was uh, it was not habitable anymore. And so, pursuant to Germany's request, seventy uh, orphans and their um, caretakers were were bussed from Gaza into Judea and Samaria yesterday. Now, this is an incredible um uh, travesty because uh what we're being so kind and so generous and so humanitarian to our enemies whereas Hamas is not even telling us which one of our hostages is still alive. And so there there is as much as I said, you know, there is a lot of unity but there is there's these like underlying elements that uh, are making us very fearful, very fearful, because these 70 orphans who, on the one hand, somebody would say, well, you know, Israel killed their parents. Yes, their parents killed our people. So where are our hostages? Um, and uh, and so th there's just, uh, there's a lot of uneasy uh, feelings about what's what's going on, even with our own people. And, and I would just ask for everybody to pray for God to guide our leaders, our military leaders, our politicians to the right way, to bring us, to help us remain united, to help us defeat the evil that is uh, that is Amalek, technically, that they wants to destroy Israel for no reason. Uh, while Israel would want to live side by side peacefully, we have nobody to deal with and, and our lives are constantly on the line. So, so, uh, so prayer, pray for us, pray for our leaders to, to have their heart in the right, um, in the right path. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Maya. That, this has been a wonderful, um, Zoom meeting. I noticed, um, there's several friends who have come on tonight who came to the various meetings. So I'd like to thank everybody who supported Shmuel and now you're coming on to the Zoom and uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you all uh, and uh, thank you so much. Um, Maya and Ju Julie, thank you so much for your time tonight and we are praying. Um, we are personally, I'm part of a national 24-hour a seven day a week prayer group for Israel. It's called Tari for Israel and it's national. So that certainly is um, part of what we're doing. And um, if there is any final question from any person, I can't see any hands. I'd like to uh, conclude the Zoom. And as, oh, there's a hand come up in. Gail, if you'd like to make it short, that would be yes. excellent. Thank you. Mine isn't a question. I just wanted to say our hearts are with you. I, I That's why I have no question. Uh, just thank you for sharing. Our hearts and prayers stay with you all the time, day and night. Every night I'm praying for the IDF going down the tunnels. I pray through the night, pray in the morning, pray for everyone, pray for your need of aid as well, your need of food and clothes and the children, the trauma, the healing, and to keep on keeping on. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank to be you. Good at
Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Um, well, there's the, the Zoom will be on again the second Tuesday next month. Um, that doesn't, uh, I think that's right without understand uh, without quickly thinking about um, PESARC, but the second Tuesdays, 7 o'clock Queensland time, and I'd like to uh, thank the ladies and close in prayer. There is so many things for us to uplift, and can we pray the blessing that you can find joy um, as we come into Purim. Um, and uh, as um, Julie said, that in the midst of all of this, you are the light and um, there is goodness and truth that comes from the Torah to the nations and you are the light unto the nations forever, for always and forever. And I would close in prayer with the opening um, verses of Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We pray this over Israel. We pray this over the soldiers. We pray this over the mothers and the grandmothers all throughout the communities. And, Lord, I just ask you to bless them in preparation for whatever's happening from the north. Lord, give them wisdom, understanding, strength in the spirit, courage and um innovative and witty knowledge understanding and and put your arms around them in every way every day praise you lord amen 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 thank you folks thank you for joining us we really we we're very touched by your support your love your prayers there is no prayer that goes unanswered and so keep praying uh, keep checking out what we're doing in Judea and Samaria, um, you know, on our website, our, our uh, social media, and uh, and just know that we we are very we're deeply appreciative of of everything that you do. Um, I know there was one quick question that uh, um, Shira in our office here was saying that somebody sent, but it one second, let me find it. I don't know if we have a minute. Um, it says, what effect does the Christian component of CFYC have on the outlook of anyone who attends these information sessions? Does anybody want to jump in on that? I'll um, repeat it. Uh, what effect does the Christian component of CFYC have on the outlook of anybody present here who is attending these sessions? The, so. the question is the question is mine. Oh, the, okay. uh, the issue is uh, this is the Christian friends of Israeli communities. Mm -hmm. What difference would what difference would our or how how differently would our outlook be if we had no Christian faith? Um, that's a very good question, and I think there would be um, a complete uh, resistance. It's, it's, it's showing um, around Australia. It's called anti-Semitism. And perhaps if we were individuals in Australia without knowledge of uh, the Lord as our God, um, then things might be a little bit different and it might look a lot like what's happening in the land. Is that yes. is that the kind of question that you're leading to? Yes, that is correct. Uh, just go a little bit further. Um, in, in my opinion, the Australian government is gradually losing its support for Israel and tending to, to move away from supporting Israel. And that, that's just my impression of what the politicians have been saying. You know, that does, do others think the same thing applies? And the second thing is, I have friends who are members of a Christian group and they refuse to 
acknowledge that Israel is still part of God's plan. I I don't agree with them at all. But anyway, that's that's their view. Is anyone else familiar with that point of view? Um, I, I have to say, I'm sorry, I just want to jump in really quickly. I just want to say that that's at least because um, I'm also responsible for social media for CFOIC. And so I have to say that uh, uh, there's a lot of anti-Semitism that um, we got. We got a huge wave of it, um, especially when I publicized uh, the uh, the tour, the mission that is going on right now. Uh, for some reason, it hit somewhere and um uh, some group, I guess, passed it to others and had over 25,000 uh, people saw it. I had thousands of responses, a lot of really ugly things from Palestinians, but also Christians. And I spoke with uh, one of them. I One of them was uh, I answered privately. And we tr- I tried to have a conversation with them about um, scriptures and and why um, supporting Israel is a biblical um requirement as a, you know, I'm not a Christian, obviously I'm Jewish, but, but from, I have many Christian friends and, and I, I understand. And also a lot of the, the verses re- that Christians rely on from what, you know, what you call the old Testament. Um, and, and I was getting nowhere with him. Eventually he blocked me and another person, uh, uh, responded saying, you obviously are not Christian. I didn't want to confirm, but like, because I speak for Christian friends of Israeli communities, and that he said, "You're obviously not Christian if you are supporting um, the, these murderers." And um, and I think that there is a lot of work in the Christian community to to speak to others who who still very much believe in replacement theology that the Jews were replaced, that the Jews have no room in God's um, continued plan for the world. Um, and, you know, we can only continue shining our light as Jews and 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 as Christians, um, if you feel that that is, you know, that is that their position is incorrect, then then there's a lot of work to be done. And, oh, I can't um, hear you. Oh, can you, is that better? Can you hear me now? No, he, uh, Graham was, uh, was unmuted, was muted. Here we are. So, oh, I'm there sorry. we go. I'm not Jewish. I'm I'm a heathen. I'm a I'm a gentile. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, t- well, I, I take you. I think that you <laughs> probably would call yourself a Christian. A Christian, most definitely, yes. Definitely. <laughs> but I find it very difficult to cope with people who also claim to be Christian but deny Israel's role in in God's plan. You know, I just don't understand how you can't have. Only half the story. The whole story is God's plan in toto. And the the prayer earlier today, earlier tonight, was wonderful. You know, praying for God to 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 continue in control and to work out His will as He wishes in His time frame. That's a wonderful prayer, which I fully support. Thank you very much for your for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing, Julie. God's covenant cannot be broken to Israel. Will never be broken. God bless you. Absolutely. You went 100%. Absolutely. And his love will never be broken. It stays the same. That's right. Very good. Very good. I'm Israel High. Um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. We're here to stay. With God's help, yes. we're here to stay. Absolutely. You know, um, just touching quickly um on what you guys are saying about the Christian population replacement of theology and these, you know, evil views. This is why this group has to meet. This is why this group has to exist. This is why it has to be on social media that other Christians see, oh, Christians for Israel? What? Why is that? That's why we have to be here. This is why this exists. If, if we, we all believe this, this group doesn't need to be meeting right now. This is why we're here and this is why we still have hope for Australia. Yeah. Well spoke. Well spoke. And also we'll stand with Israel right through. We'll be We'll be suffering as well and counting the cost because we won't be popular as anti-Semitism has shown for standing with Israel. But we know God stands with Israel 
loves her. And he has made this covenant since Abraham. It cannot be broken. He must fulfill it. It's given the land. No one can take it from Israel, from Jewish people. And he'll still bring some more home to Mechalia. That's from the Bible. <laughs> I want to say, I have something I want to say about that, actually. Um, uh, you know, Abraham was called the Hebrew, the Ha'ivli. And Ha'ivli, which is the Hebrew in, in English, um, means, comes from the word Evel, which is side, meaning he was on the other side. The whole world around him was were idol worshipers. And he had the strength and the courage to be on the other side. And that is something that he has passed down to his descendants, um, the spiritual DNA, to be able to be courageous and, and know that I'm standing with what's right and what's true, regardless of how hard it is. Um, and uh, and just connecting it to, to Esther, actually, uh, one of the things that repeats in the scroll of Esther many times is that she found, as uh, she was, I don't know how you said it in English, but I'll translate from Hebrew because um, uh, she was pleasing, she went you know, to, to others or she found grace, other found grace within her. Um, and, uh, and she went through this transition because she was a person with, who came from nothing, who came from no parents. You know, she always tried to get confirmation from others that she is accepted, that she is, you know, good, beautiful, doing the right thing. And, and we live in a world especially with social media, where we are almost addicted to what others think of us. Um, yes. And, and that is, and, and, and we need to disconnect. We need yep. to disconnect from that. Our only mm -hmm. lifeline is God and God's word. And, mm -hmm. and what others find displeasing in us, if they are contradict, if they are standing against God, against God's word and his will against the Jewish people and the Jewish state, then then I don't care what they think of me. Yeah. I couldn't care less because who are they? Humans versus the creator of the universe. Yep. I'll just and, I'll just make oh, they will sorry. give an account to God as well. And we all will. And it, I was just reading about those who've lost sight of God's judgment. We will all give an account and how we have treated Israel. Have we prayed for Israel? Have we prayed for the fulfillment of his Promise that we helped people in Israel. It's it's we grafted in as the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile grafted in. I just thank God He gave me the full understanding of Israel about ten years later after I came to be a Christian to know Christ. But it opened my eyes. No one had told me in church. I just found a group who prayed for Israel, and from then on, I learned. And He just opens people's understanding. I think, you know, he knows the ones who will have a heart for Israel and he knows the ones like Pharaoh who will harden their heart. Uh, so we, we go so far with certain people, but they, if they're resistant, we know to leave them in God's hands for him to convict. And like you said, we're not to worry about how they think of us. Do you think? Yeah. It's I think it'll sort of touch on J Graham's question. I'd make probably quick three three very quick points. Students these days aren't taught history at all, so unless you're a history buff, there's a lot of things you don't know. Secondly, many Christians don't even know the Old Testament history of the nation of Israel, or they have a very hazy outline of it. So they don't they don't have the kind of knowledge that perhaps you and I might take for granted. And on the issue of the Australian government, and I made a comment in the chat, there are groups that are actively lobbying the government uh, to uh, act in a way that might be seen as pro-Palestinian or certainly not supporting, supported, supportive of Israel. And so we need to be pushing back against that, I think. Absolutely. Mm. We do. And um, we're, I'm he heavily involved with the Never Again Is Now and uh, we're really uh, uh, supporting the Jewish communities in Queensland. I'm on the Queensland team, and uh, we're trying to get the message out in our elections that are happening on Saturday. So uh, there is a lot of uh, good Australians standing up against uh, this, this baseless hatred.
We are All in right. momentum. All right, folks. We will say good night now. Good night, everybody. God bless you. Good night. God bless you all. Good night. Show Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Great. Be strong and of good courage. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Amen. Lila Tov. Lila Tov. Thank you.